Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Authority. I'm your host, Joseph Pierce, where we continue this tour through some of the greatest authors of Western civilization. Um, and this uh, week we are looking at Evelyn War, um, a great 20th century novelist and convert to the Catholic faith, who's the author in uh, author of what, in my opinion, is the greatest novel of the 20th century. Of course, this is a subjective judgment. Uh, I would hasten to add, by the way, that uh, The Lord of the Rings, which is the greatest work of literature of the 20th century, is not uh, a novel. It's more like a prose epic. It has more in common with... Uh, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, and, and the Divine Comedy than it has with a modern novel. So, so the greatest novel of the 20th century, in my, in my judgment, is uh, Brideshead Revisited. So we're looking this week at the author of that wonderful novel and of several other wonderful novels, Evelyn War. So he was a, a child of the 20th century. Uh, he was born in 1903 and died in 1966. Um, he... Um, I'm going to go. We're going to go back and forth uh, somewhat between Bride's Head Revisited, the novel, uh, which I'll be talking about at greater length uh, later uh, in the episode. But the the, the the autobiographical elements in Bride's Head Revisited, so things that are in that novel that actually reflect aspects of of War's own life. So although he made a point at the beginning of that novel saying that I am not I, in other words, do not try to read too much uh, autobiographical. Uh, too much of an autobiographical dimension into the reading of the novel. Nonetheless, of course, or the, the, the novelists do draw from their own personal experience. The fact that Charles Ryder, the uh, the narrator of that novel, is exactly the same age as, uh, as as Evening War and went through some very similar experiences is something which is eyebrow raising, and I will draw attention to. One of which is uh, in um, uh, Brighter if it's the the, 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 the narrator Charles talks about how at school he lost his Christian faith because of his religion teachers not clearly not really believing in in the in, in the religion of which they're teaching basically casting doubt upon uh, religious belief rather than elucidating it. Well, War went through this exact experience at Lansing College. So Lansing College is a, uh, a public school. Now, you have to understand, you know, that there's, as Winston Churchill said, that um, that the, uh, the American English and British English, or the Americans and the British are, are two people divided by common language. Uh, in other words, that uh, you know, British English and American English are not always exactly the same. My wife, uh, who's American, said when she for says to friends that when she uh, married me, she started learning English as a second language. So uh, the reason I, I, for that preamble is the word public school, obviously in the United States, is a school which is a state-run school. Uh, in England, a public school is actually a private school, I, I, as, as nonsensical as that might sound. So uh, he went to a public school, so one of the poshest private schools in England, Lansing College, it's called Lansing College, it's actually a high school, um, and it's on the south coast and the south downs in Sussex, uh, has a beautiful uh, uh, neo-Gothic chapel, uh, part of that uh, 19th century neo-medievalism and the Gothic revival in architecture. It's a beautiful chapel there, but it was that while he, Evening War was a student at Lansing College, that uh, that he lost his faith, and he lost his faith because of uh, the, his religion teacher, one, one particular religion teacher called Rawlinson, who clearly was a modernist uh, in a theological sense. In other words, didn't necessarily believe in unchanging truths, but in the in a church that has to adapt itself uh, and adopt 
uh, the ideas of the times. As G.K. Chesterton famously said, we don't want a church that will move with the world. We want a church that will move the world. Well, the the religion teacher at Lansing College, someone called Wallinson, uh, wanted a church that would move with the world. He was a theological modernist and constantly he, he cast doubt on many of the fundamental doctrines of Christianity. And in consequence, one of his students, uh, the Young Evening War, became an atheist, stopped being a Christian from that moment. Uh, it says something, by the way, the modernist bent in the Anglican church in the 20th century that um, this religion teachers, uh, who is uh, an Anglican clergyman, did not prevent his being successful within the Anglican church. Indeed, he was later made the Bishop of Derby. And that speaks volumes in itself. Then, uh, having lost his faith, he went on to Oxford and lived a rather hedonistic, drunken and debauched existence as an undergraduate at Oxford. The lovers of Brideshead Revisited will see uh, parallels again between Charles Ryder's experience at Oxford just after World War I and um, even in War's experience at exactly the same time. War was a lover of the Pre-Raphaelites. So again, in the 19th century, part of the, 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 the birth of the Catholic cultural literary revival was the, it was the growth of neo-medievalism uh, as part of the romantic reaction to the scientism and empiricism of the Enlightenment. And so one of those manifestations of neo-medievalism, uh, we mentioned the Gothic revival, revival, hence the wonderful chapel at Lansing College. But another was that were the pre-Raphaelite was the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood uh, in, in, in art and literature. And uh, the young evening war had a great love for uh, the pre-Raphaelites and he wrote a, a study of them and, it, and his first book was a biography of the pre-Raphaelite artist Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Uh, pre-Raphaelite artist and poet. So this is how he, he begins. We see, if you like, at least an aesthetic sensibility and sympathy for things Catholic, even though at this point in his life he is um, not a, a Christian. His first novel was called Decline and Fall, and again there's an autobiographical dimension. You see parallels between the character in the novel and the real-life young uh, 20-something evening war. The novel was published in 1928. In the novel, there's an account of an attempted suicide, which is which is quashed, uh, which is, uh, which is does not take place because of the fact that uh, he, the, the the would be suicide was stung by a jellyfish, not once but twice. So in real life, uh, Evening War decided it was time to end it all. He'd reached a low. Uh, and thought suicide was the exit route from uh, his miserable dead end life, and he decided to walk out into the ocean uh, and 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 and, uh, sorry, and then swim out in the ocean and drown. And he was stung once by a jellyfish and stung again. And so we see, if you like, the jellyfish as if, uh, as a mark of providence. God moves in mysterious ways, um, and these jellyfish actually save even in War's life and save. Uh, all those novels that he he was yet to write um, from uh, entering the uh, the oblivion of uh, of suicide. He then, however, ha having survived that experience, uh, became embroiled in a romantic relationship, which very quickly uh, ended in a rather ill-advised and very short-lived marriage. His name's Evelyn. Americans sometimes say Evelyn. Uh, the, the British say Evelyn, and believe it or not, uh, Evelyn married a, a lady called Evelyn. So they were known, not surprisingly, as he Evelyn or she e and, and she Evelyn, or if you like, Hevelyn and Shevelyn. Uh, but this was a this was a um, an ill advised and, and very tumultuous and short lived marriage. Uh, and while w War was writing his next novel, which would be published later as Vile Bodies, in the midst of that. Um, his wife uh, writes to him to confess that she's been having an adulterous relationship. This is within a year of their marriage uh, with uh, with one of Evening War's friends. Uh, War is absolutely mortified by this uh, experience um, uh, and uh, for a while cannot do any writing. But eventually he picks up 
vol bodies. And if you look at vol bodies, I think you can detect, at least I think I can detect, where he uh, stopped off writing when he was a uh, happy newlywed, or so he thought, uh, with a sort of, some sort of whimsical uh, aspect to things, uh, with this much much more wistful uh, and uh, and um, almost sneering satire uh, in the second half of the novel. But vol bodies, amongst other things, the vol bodies are um, those young people of war's generation in their 20s who were living hedonistic existences devoid of, of, of faith or ultimately reason. Uh, they were known as flappers in those days, the, 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 the young ladies particularly. Uh, the bright young things was another group, another name for them. But uh, we, talk, we talked uh, in, in our episode on T.S. Eliot about T.S. Eliot's talking about the hollow men and how C.S. Lewis uh, spoke about these hollow men as men without chests and how uh, Evening War introduces these hollow men, uh, these vile bodies, if you like, into his novel, Bride Said Revisited. So uh, we see here that War is very influenced by uh, by, by T.S. Eliot. Uh, in, indeed, his, his greatest pre-war novel, A Handful of Dust, um, the title of that novel uh, is taken from some lines from The Wasteland by Eliot. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Um, and so we see the influence of, of T.S. Eliot's modernism and this idea of this sort of rather pathetic, fatuous uh, abandonment of chastity for no particular reason that we see Eliot talk about in perhaps in, in, in various parts of that the wasteland, but especially perhaps in the famous episode of the typist and the young man Carbuncular, and how uh, the the typist just decides to throw away her virginity because it's a rite of passage that she thinks she has to go through. It's all rather pathetic um, and, and 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 rather facile. Well, again, the, the vol bodies is about that. A handful of dust, 1934. Um, is uh, is similar, but there's a maturity in a handful of dust, which is probably why it's my favourite of War's pre-war novels, pre-World War II novels. Uh, has a maturity, but again, showing the 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 fatuity of of of, of modernity. But uh, the reason is, of course, by between writing Vile Bodies and writing A Handful of Dust between 1930 and 1934, something momentous happened in Evening War's life, and that was his conversion to Catholicism. So um, uh, I want to go over those aspects of what led War to rediscover his Christian faith, and, and, and this time specifically in in Catholicism. Uh, and we, we have here a letter that he wrote to Father Martin Darcy. We should say something about who Father Darcy is. He was a Jesuit uh, at the Church of the Immaculate Conception in Mayfair, Farm Street in Mayfair in the West end of London, a uh, very, very famous church for where the, the wealthy live. Uh, Mayfair, in the British version of Monopoly, is the most expensive place to put up a hotel. So that will give you some idea of the, the area. We're talking about a rather posh part of town. Um, Father Darcy uh, had a reputation for bringing fairly many high-profile celebrities, we might now call them, uh, into the Catholic Church or, or instructing them uh, in, into being entered. So this is a letter uh, and the character of Father Mowbray in Bryce Head Revisited is based upon Father Martin Darcy. So here we have Eve, Evening while writing to fa uh, Father Darcy. He says, As I said when we first met, I realized that the Roman Catholic Church is the only genuine form of Christianity. Also that Christianity is the essential and formative constituent of Western culture. But the trouble is that I don't feel Christian in the absolute sense. The question seems to be, must I wait until I do feel this? Or can I become a Catholic when I am in such an incomplete state and so get the benefits of the sacraments and receive faith afterwards? That's the question and um, what I write here. One can surmise the nature of Father Darcy's reply from War's later comment that Darcy, quote, saw it was no good hoping for much and the thing to do was just to get the seed in anyhow and hope some of it would come up. I would, I look back aghast, War wrote two decades later, at the presumption with which I thought myself suitable 
for reception and with wonder at the trust of the priest who saw the possibility of growth in such a dry soul, end quote. Soon after his return from Ireland, War broke the news of his intentions to his parents. Arthur War recorded in his diary that his wife was very, very sad over news of Evelyn's success, secession to Rome. War was received by Father Darcy at the Church of the Immaculate Conception in Farm Street on the 29th of September 1930. According to his own account, the step had been taken, quote, on firm intellectual conviction, but with little emotion. You might actually see a pattern if you've been watching some listening, watching or listening to some of these earlier episodes. Uh, the, the same sort of uh, submission of the church on grounds of reason but uh, with not necessarily a lot of uh, emotion going with it. We see it in the conversion of um, uh, of uh, St. John Henry Newman. We see it in the conversion of Robert Hugh Benson uh, uh, and in Graham Greene. One is reminded of Robert Hugh Benson's unemotional reception into the church a quarter of a century earlier. Quote, I do not suppose that anyone ever entered the city of God with less emotion than mine. There was the truth as aloof as an ice peak, and I had to embrace it, end quote. In fact, Benson and War shared more than their vastly different temperaments and writing styles might suggest. Both had a deep love for the old Catholic nobility of England, their houses and their traditions, and War's Brideshead Revisited was to conjure up the same atmosphere as that which permeated many of Benson's novels. So parallels between these two great uh, novelists. Um, I'm not conversion. Oh, yes, and there's this wonderful quote by War about his conversion, which actually uses the epigraph to this whole book, Literary Converts. Conversion is like stepping across the chimney piece out of a looking glass world where everything is an absurd caricature into the real world God made and then begins the delicious process of exploring it limitlessly. Okay, so War's conversion. Um, I'm now going to go on to discuss, I guess it's been something of the way we've done things sometimes, just one of the works in greater depth. Uh, and this time it's Brideshead Revisited. And a few things I want to say about that um, is first of all, the title. Uh, the Brideshead, literally in the story, is the name of a castle. Uh, a stately home in the countryside um, in which the flight family of this Lord Marshmain's family lives. Um, but of course, the name Bride's Head, even if one made up, then why choose that particular name? Well, the bride's head, of course, is the bridegroom. And uh, as Christ says in the gospel, that uh, he is the bridegroom and the church is therefore the bride. So in San Sa and, and the church, uh, um, uh, one of the titles of the church is the mystical body of Christ, as well as being the bride of Christ, that fusion, uh, the one flesh uh, the, of, the, of, of marriage, which is a mystery in itself, but that mystical marriage that makes the Catholic church both the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, that fusion between the two. So in some sense, bride's head represents or signifies the church um, and that the... Uh, the church not in its transcendental, ultimate spiritual sense, where the Catholic Church is uh, the church triumphant in heaven, the church suffering in purgatory, and the church militant on earth. Um, this uh, is the more limited understanding of the church on earth, where uh, we see in the flight family, the, they're all Catholics, but of very different types from the devout, but... Um, perhaps yeah, devout but inept to the very much undevout, those who find their faith a burden. So these people, to one degree or another, are living or failing to live the faith, but they are at least all part of that family, bride's head, the bridegroom, the church. The other very important thing is in the, the preface to the second edition of, of uh, Bride's Head Revisiting, Revisited, uh, War says explicitly that the theme of the novel is the the working of uh, providence, uh, in other words, divine grace, in the lives of some closely connected but different individuals. So, so what War's saying there actually is the protagonist of the novel 
is an invisible protagonist. It's the invisible hand of God moving through events, moving through the lives of the other characters, which ultimately is the protagonist, the one who's making things happen, the hand of providence. So, so Bright City Visited, we have little choice if we're going to read it as War wrote it, but to try to read it spiritually, to see the presence of God in the story. Another key factor, when I, when I teach Bright City Visited, I always, one of my favorite paper prompts to give to the students um, is uh, Lady Marshmane, innocent or guilty, and give the case for the prosecution, the case for the defense, and then act as the judge summing up the evidence and passing your verdict. So uh, who was Lady Marshman? Well, she's the, uh, the, the uh, matriarch of the family. So she'd been deserted by her husband who went off to fight in World War I and never came back and is now living in Venice with a concubine, living in sin, if you like, deserting his wife and four children, two sons, two daughters. Lady Marshman is his wife. She's very devout but somewhat cold and aloof and somewhat socially inept. And one of the questions is, uh, um, to what extent is she responsible for the, the, the troubled relationship that at least two of her children have with the Catholic faith? Is she partly responsible for this? To what extent is that her, her husband responsible having deserted the family? These are good, good questions. And, and in part of summing up the evidence on Lady Marshmain, you know, it's not just what she, what she does, it's what she says, but more to the point and more dangerously, what other people say about her, uh, what other people say she does and, uh, and she says, and um, why do they say it? So in other words, trying to find out whether she is uh, positive or negative uh, impact on the story is one of the mysteries of the story. The other thing about the story is that the first half of the story, and uh, it's entitled Et in Arcadia Ego, I also lived in paradise effectively. Um, everyone is drifting further and further away from the church, from Christ. And the second part of the story, um, a twitch upon the thread, everyone is moving uh, uh, back towards Christ. The twitch upon the thread is, is an intertextual reference to a, a Father Brown story by G.K. Chesterton, where... Uh, Father Brown says that, that the sinner will, will wander off to the ends of the, 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 the earth, but God can still bring him back with a twitch upon the thread. So the role of God as a fisherman here, and although we wander far away from him, we're still on the line, that line of grace, if you like. But that tug on the line, that twitch upon the thread, is, of course, a moment of suffering. Uh, when we're not allowed to go where we want because we're prevented from doing so. Uh, so th th it's the importance of suffering in conversion. So another very powerful metaphor in, 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 in Bride's Holy Visited comes up towards the end and is, becomes a motif repeated three times, is of an avalanche where um, Charles and Julia have this nice cosy relationship. They're having a, a, an extramarital affair with each other. They're both married. But they're looking forward to their divorce, and then they can they can they can move forward. Um, but this little uh, cozy menage, uh, which might, might might offer them the uh, the uh, hope of worldly happiness, is destroyed, and it's destroyed ironically by the hand of grace. Um, so I don't want to give too much of the story uh, away, um, but this this connection between suffering and conversion, and how they're uh, the discussion of happiness. Is it about happiness? Is life about happiness? And if it is about happiness, what sort of happiness is it about? So you see here, um, some so this in this wonderful novel, which I could say much more about. Um, it's it, it, we, some of the deepest uh, aspects of what it is to be human, what it is to be a, a son or daughter of God. Uh, our relationship with God, our relationship with our neighbors, etc. Well, I'm going to conclude this episode even more by looking at his response to some of the madness that happened in the 1960s. And 19, well, not 1970, he died in 1966, but the beginning of the madness, uh, uh, the so called spirit of Vatican II, the modernist nonsense that was going on, uh, which was not even part of the authentic teaching of the Second Vatican Council. 
So how did the evening war respond to particularly the changes to the mass, to the holy sacrifice of the mass? So Pope John the 23rd evening wrote in a letter to his friend Anne Fleming concerning the Second Vatican Council, quote, had no idea of the Pandora's box he was opening. And as we move on, War writes then, uh, talking about the traditional mass, this was the mass for whose restoration the Elizabethan martyrs had gone to the scaffold. St. Augustine, St. Thomas a Becket, St. Thomas More, Chaloner and Newman would have been perfectly at their ease among us, were in fact present there with us. Their presence would not have been more palpable had we been making the responses aloud in the modern fashion. And then Moore dismissed the liturgical reformers as, quote, a strange alliance between archaeologists absorbed in their speculations on the rites of the second century and modernists who wish to give the church the character of our own deplorable epoch. And to continue, he wrote... He wrote a letter to the tablet, a, a Catholic magazine. Uh, Will you promote an appeal to the Holy See for the establishment of Uniate Latin Church, which shall observe all the rites as they existed in the reign of Pius the Ninth? Uh, and then in another letter, he says, some people like Penelope Betjeman, that's the wife of the poet Sir John Betjeman, like making a row in church. And I don't see why they shouldn't, just as the Abyssinians dance and wave rattles. I should feel jolly shy dancing and I feel shy praying out loud. Every parish might have one rowdy mass a Sunday for those who like it, but there should be silent ones for those who like quiet. The Uniate churches are highly relevant. They are allowed to keep their ancient habits of devotion and to have a ritual in languages like Syriac, Byzantine Greek, Gears, Slavonic, which are much deader than Latin. Why should we not have a Uniate Roman church and let the Germans have their own knockabout performances. And then uh, this is something which uh, prefigures the writing of the great uh, Benedict XVI on the spirit of the liturgy. Uh, Evening War says, active participation doesn't necessarily mean making a noise. Only God knows who is participating. People can pray loudly like the Pharisee and not be heard much more here so uh, let's carry on reading here on 6th of august the day before his own letter appeared in the catholic herald war read a letter in the times from a correspondent who was distressed by the news that the catholic church was officially to adopt english as the language of the mass quote this will cause a real distress to many people after near 2000 years of a universal latin mass the correspondent had written and as the use of the vernacular is to obtain in all countries, we shall be strangers in each other's countries where till now we have been at home. When we go abroad, the innovation will split the Roman Catholic Church in England from top to bottom. And again, it's another irony here, of course, that in our globalized culture, the traditional mass is the same all over the world with one language for all peoples. Uh, so we can be in Italy or Germany or Africa and have the same mass and know what's going on and exactly the time when we live in a globalized culture the church abandons its globalized language which is curious um so again evening war uh, we're going to finish a bit more in in this frame of mind war could gain little solace or joy at easter his diary entry on easter sunday was that of a psycho psychologically battered and broken man a year in which the process of transforming the liturgy has followed a planned course. Protests avail nothing. Cardinal Heenan has been double-faced in the matter. I had dinner with him at deux, in which he expressed complete sympathy with the Conservatives and, as I understood him, promised resistance to the innovations which he is now pressing forward. How does he suppose the cause of participation is furthered by the prohibition of kneeling at the incarnatus in the creed? The Catholic press has made no opposition. I shall not live to see things righted. Uh, but he says later on here, the church 
has endured and survived many dark periods. It is our misfortune to live in one of them. Um, and then um, he gets permission to have a traditional mass set at Easter Sunday, 1966. Um, and he goes to confession, goes to mass. And I'm just going to give the final moments of Evening War's life to conclude. It's a glorious way to go. On Easter Sunday, 10th of April, at 10 o'clock in the morning, Father Caraman celebrated a Latin mass at the Catholic chapel in uh, Riveliscum, five miles from the War family home. Only a few friends and family were present. As they came out of church, several of those present noticed how cheerful war seemed. Father Caraman remarked how calm and contented he appeared. His depression evaporated, almost as though he had finally come through some dark night of the soul. He was benign and at peace, with a kind of tranquility and serenity that as a priest one often meets in people who are dying. War, war collapsed. That was a quote, by the way, by Father Caraman. War collapsed and died an hour or so later. So having been shriven, having uh, gone to confession, having received Holy Communion, the traditional Mass, an hour or so later he collapses and dies. I think he had been praying for death for a long time, and it could not have happened more beautifully or happily for him, his wife wrote to Lady Diana Cooper. So I can only thank God for his mercy, but life will never be the same for us without him. Margaret, his daughter, also wrote to Lady Diana Cooper in words more of joy than sorrow. Don't be too upset about Papa. I think it was a kind of wonderful miracle. You know how he longed to die and dying as he did on Easter Sunday, when all the liturgy is about death and resurrection, after a Latin Mass and Holy Communion would be exactly as he wanted. I am sure he prayed for death at Mass. I am very happy for him. So there's the sublime ending to the life of Evelyn War, uh, which matches the, uh, in its miraculous nature, perhaps the sublime ending of some of his novels, not least of perhaps the um, the uh, the deathbed conversion of Lord Marshmain in Bryce have been visited. So thanks so much for joining me in this episode of uh, um, The Authority. Please do join me next time. And until next time, goodbye, God bless, and good reading. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.